That is a tasty plasma. Maybe I could sneak in and watch Final Fantasy Spirits Within. I don't care what anybody says, that's one of the best sci-fi films ever made. Okay, hold up. We've discussed a few movies here at What Happened Already, but thanks to big boss Trey Adams down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon, I'm now forced to talk about another one. And this just might be among the most infamous money-wasting film disasters of all time. And who would have thunk it? It just so happens to be based on a video game. I didn't see that coming. While we've already covered the cinematic tour de forces that were Super Mario Brothers and MK Annihilation, those were monumental shining pinnacles of excellence when compared to Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, a project that failed so hard by every quantifiable metric it should be taught in some type of failed film school for big floppy failures. Now, I know what you're sighing. Yeah, that movie was kind of weird, N not what I wanted, but like whatever. No, it's not just like whatever, because while you could write off this experimental marriage between video game cutscenes and theatrical cinema as an inoffensive, forgettable sci-fi romp. It's the behind-the-scenes ska, the business deals, the wildly ballooning budget, and its giant stinky miasma that's the real story here. Spirits Within affected several big companies and prominent figures in ways you can't possibly imagine. It, it, in fact, it's beyond all you can imagine. This is where failure becomes reality. So, in and around 1997, executives and higher-ups at Squaresoft, let's not mince words, were getting blazed as hell and throwing around cash like it was going out of style. Bolstered by the monstrous success of Final Fantasy VII, they fast-tracked the next game in the franchise and basically never stopped after that. Square had bet big on Seven. They'd spent a lot of money on things like four discs, lots of employees, fancy 3D models, and getting to our point, big expensive CGI cutscenes. The quality of these animated sequences blew people away in the late 90s, because around this time you'd typically be getting stuff like this. Uh, thus, Squaresoft bigwigs decided, why just limit this to video games? Let's use all parts of the Chocobo and spin this technology off into other mediums, with motion pictures being the next logical choice. To do this, they'd need to prove it was even possible. Thus, a team within Square set to work on a proof-of-concept pitch titled The Grey Project, which was an appropriate title in more ways than one. It focused on two characters arguing, which, while not terribly ambitious, was intended to convey human emotions as well as realistic cloth and hair physics. When the test animation was completed, the feedback within Square was very positive, so they went about setting up a studio to build off what they had learned on the Great Project to then turn it into a major motion picture. And to get the most eyeballs on it, it would be based on Square's flagship RPG series. So far, so good. Now, just a few years previous, Toy Story already broke through the mainstream to prove that CG animated films could be accepted and even embraced by the mainstream. So Square, trying to leap ahead to produce something more realistic and for an older demographic, seemed well-timed. But of course, since this is what happens, so far so good can only last for so long. Square did not have enough room within their own Japanese offices to accommodate for this massive new project, as they need an additional 200 employees while their main workforce was already feverishly slaving away on junctioning and gun blades. Therefore, a new office would need to be opened, and thus Square Pictures was founded in Honolulu, Hawaii in early 1998, and was comprised of a more international team, taking advantage of the location as it was a nice middle ground between the US and Japan. The problem here though is that while being able to tap from both East and West talent pools as well as technology was a positive, the price tag of setting up a brand new cutting edge studio in an offshore island state was exceedingly costly. Rough estimates peg Square Pictures Studio at around $46 million to start up, as they needed to buy Pentium workstations that were so expensive that only the four richest kings of Europe could own them. 
The studio got straight to work, and this would kick off a four-year journey that would see Final Fantasy The Spirits Within released in the summer of 2001. To ensure the success of this ambitious and, as we'll see, risky venture, Square would turn to one of the most reliable creators, Final Fantasy father Hironobu Sakaguchi, who had settled into more of a shepherd and producer role in recent years. The film was to be co-directed by Sakaguchi and Wamotonori Sakaguchi, Kibara, who logically also directed the CG cutscenes from both FF7 and 8. Now, the core story of Spirits Within was also handled by Sakaguchi, which is pretty obvious as some of the general concepts of his past work make a return here. However, the screenplay, meaning the actual character dialogue and such, was handled by Al Reinert and one Jeff Vinter. Al's credits include Apollo 13, and Vinter would go on to write 2004's I Robot. So you can see that Sakaguchi's ideas that include things like the fate and destiny of a chosen hero, ambitious but misguided villains, and powerful ancient streams of life emanating from the earth, uh, let's just call them Vita strings, might clash when paired with docudrama style space exploration and sci fi, but there's no might about it. The story and dialogue were constantly at war with each other, but you know, more on that later. So I gather this will be somewhat of a rough ride. Doc, you've got a talent for understatement. Square Pictures, despite the proof of concept that was the great project, still had so, so, so so many more things they needed to work out. Unlike, say, a traditional film where a script is finalized before a shoot or tweaked during principal photography, the script and dialogue for Spirits Within was ever-changing during the four years of that principal photography, which was basically 200 animators sitting at their desks. Now, even for an animated film, four years is an untypically, incredibly long time for just one movie. Hell, the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy took less time to film. This is because to render just one frame of Final Fantasy, it took like a thousand minutes or like a, a, an hour. It, it took a while. It doesn't matter the exact figures because every virtual character or actor was composed of over a hundred thousand polygons, which was unheard of at around this time frame. Hell, in 1998, Lara's breasts were still composed of like Three. So, 100,000 polygons being rendered on the most bleedingest of bleeding edge tech, frame by frame, by 200 people for four years? That's gonna cost a lot of gill. And at some point, that cost, the technical achievement of Spirits Within, was viewed as the most important factors. And in terms of the bottom line, yeah, that's true. But what was viewed as secondary was everything else. The story, the characters, and the dialogue. Now, Sakaguchi cut his teeth working on RPGs, long, drawn-out narratives that would doll out character motivations, backstories, and the grander plot gradually over the course of dozens of hours. But then someone came up to him and said, yeah, can you do all that, but like in two? And, uh, sorry, uh, I, I meant one hour and 46 minutes, because it'll cost too much if we make it any longer than that. Okay, great. See you later. That's fucked up. So with that in mind, I don't think Sakaguchi was the best person to write this, given this restriction. In fact, I don't know who would have been the correct person, because it's just not a very good good idea. Cramming all this rich narrative into a theatrical film? I mean, why couldn't there have just been a Final Fantasy anime instead? Hey, look what I've got for you. Hold on. It's alright. Here you go. It's some choco 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 chocolate for you. Oh. Anyway, while the technical progress was slow but impressive, the script was getting more and more convoluted, which was weird because it was also simultaneously shockingly simple. The talent to bring these characters to quote unquote life would be Ming Na as Aki Ross, Donald Sutherland as Dr. Sid. No, not not that Sid, but spelt this with this Sid for some reason? The Shadow, Alex Baldwin as Grey Edwards, aka every video game protagonist from 2002 to still now. And real life icky supervillain James Woods as your Sephiroth stand-in, General Hine. Aliens invaded the Earth decades ago and to stop them it all comes down to a clash of ideologies as Aki, Sid, Grey, and the rest all race against the clock to collect a bunch of ghosts. One is in a backpack. I, I, 
I don't get it. Before Hein uses the BFG 10,000 to nuke all the aliens and I guess the world. In all of my research, I'm not sure why this setting was chosen, but I can hazard a guess. Square teamed up with Sony, naturally, on the film, and Sony turned to one of their own studios, Columbia, to distribute. Perhaps at some point, executives slash producers felt that spiky-haired anime boys or genetically engineered red lion dogs and comically oversized nonsense swords wasn't the best choice to appeal to a mass worldwide audience. So what are we left with? with um, soldiers wearing gray armor or, or t-shirts or everyone's just wearing gray, sometimes black, and you know, you don't want to scare off the normies. This was another decision that doomed the project from the outset. Not enough Final Fantasy to appeal to fans of Final Fantasy, but still too weird in its themes and story to appeal to anyone else. So when trailers first started popping up, I, on a personal level, remember hearing everyone saying how amazing the film looked visually, but being confused as to why this was even called Final Fantasy. Where is the magic? The Phoenix Downs, the Chocobos, the airships, the fantasy. Even 7 and 8, as different as they were, still managed to keep some series tropes intact. Just another example that if you try to meet vastly different demographics halfway, you're almost always not going to meet any of them. It was around this time where more and more focus was being put on the film's visuals instead of, you know, talking more about the story and the characters. Well, with one exception. Aki Ross started getting pushed as a virtual actress, which back then was a ridiculous statement to make. But nowadays, it's even more ridiculous. The concept would be that Aki would appear in other films after Final Fantasy's assured success. It would become a star within the Hollywood Digiverse. Now, when you start talking talking more about future plans over the current film you're supposed to be advertising, then you may be losing the plot. Regardless, Square and Columbia kept pushing, and even had Aki appear in Maxim's Hot 100, in a bikini no less. Listen, if you're gonna pull a claim like stunts leading into the launch of your heady sci-fi space opera, you know something's up. But when it comes down to it though, I don't blame them. They needed to make sure this thing would be a success, so they utilized the two oldest marketing tactics known to man, violence and ditties. The violence part comes via the trailers of Spirits Within, which took the very few action set pieces and edited them to look like starship goddamn troopers, despite action making up the smallest sliver of the movie's running time. This is most likely due to executives and producers and pretty much everyone else who worked on it, realizing that it was shaping up to be an incoherent mess in terms of its story, but said to themselves, but it looks so good though, let's, let's just focus on that guys, which again, given the circumstances, was probably the right play. So, during interviews or in general marketing, they'd throw out all those aforementioned metrics. 100,000 polygons, 915 Pentium 3 workstations, 1,327 shots, 141,964 frames, and it took 120 prison years, yikes, to complete. Uh, cool. Uh, what's the story about? I don't understand. You don't have to understand. So now, for all of those of you playing at home, how much? Take a guess, what was the final budget for Final Fantasy The Spirits Within? Honolulu Studio, four years, the newest in CGI trickery? Throw out a number. If you said $76 million, then you're right. Here's a firm but brief virtual handshake that I would be giving you if the project had stayed on that original projected budget. But instead, uh, things kind of got out of hand because $177 million. This was more expensive than Terminator 2, Waterworld, and was for a time only bested by Titanic in terms of money spent. Leading to release, the film Squaresoft producer Jun Ida admitted, we did end up spending more than what we planned, but it's not by any means a massive number compared to what other major studios have spent on similar features, which 
as we discussed, is not very true at all. Oof. So, Final Fantasy launched on July 11th, 2001, which was literally the best time it could have. FF9 had just released the previous year, and was well liked by both critics and fans, except for kids who started with FF7, of course. And only a few months later, Final Fantasy X was set to light PS2's ablaze, as it was the most pre-ordered game of all time in 2001. So this was right smack dab in the middle of Final Fantasy fever, therefore it was logical to assume those same fans would come out and support its big screen debut. But again, throw out a number. What was its weekend tally where you make the most money? How much of a dent did they put into that $177 million price tag? $11 million. <laughs> Final Fantasy belly flopped into fourth place for that summer weekend, with Legally Blonde topping the list. But it's not all about the North American weekend haul. How did the movie do worldwide? Surely that'll offset the... Oh. Okay. The Washington Post called it bewildering and trite. LA Weekly felt it was soulless, and the New York Post said it had both a predictable yet nonsensical plot coupled with laughably lame dialogue. However, the late Roger Ebert did give the movie a positive review, stating, The story is nuts and bolts space opera, lacking the intelligence and daring of many others in the genre. But the look of the film is revolutionary. Final Fantasy is a technical milestone, like the first talkies or 3D movies. You want to see it whether you care about aliens or space cannons. And that's the common thing among many reviews. Yeah, this isn't very good, but it still looks so stunning. Hell, even in 2020, looking back, I'm shocked at how well it holds up. Aside from those tiny victories, the box office was just too embarrassing, and not only did this doom Square Pictures, it got close to destroying Squaresoft itself. This was such a catastrophic loss, $94 million, that threatened the merger that Square was negotiating twixt themselves and fellow publisher Enix. Talks between the two Japanese giants have been happening since 2000, but this sudden downturn in business shook Enix's confidence. Why merge with a company that was doing poorly? So it actually delayed the negotiations for a few more years, until Square thankfully bounced back thanks to a money in Injection by Sony Computer Entertainment, along with the brisk sales of FF10 and Kingdom Hearts, and Enix's confidence was fully renewed. Square Pictures, as you can imagine, was folded back into the main workforce, and its Honolulu office was closed, but not before they finished their last contracted work, which was the Animatrix short Flight of the Osiris. And yeah, that's, that's it. However, there was one more person that took the failure of spirits within harder than the rest, and that was Hironobu Sakaguchi. As is a common thing in Japanese business, if you are the head of a failed project, like a really failed project, a lot of the onus is placed on you, even if it's not exactly fair. The Sakaguchi voluntarily left Square in 2003 and cites spirits within as one of the reasons why. Since his departure, Final Fantasy has been, uh, let's say, shaky. Shaky is accurate. But after enough time had passed, they tested the waters once again with two other CG films like Advent Rising, uh, I mean Advent Children, and Kingsglaive, which got even worse reviews than Spirits Within somehow. So they haven't completely abandoned the idea, just mostly. Now, this isn't just a case of a thing being made that wasn't very good, but rather a confluence of decisions that led to ultimate failure. Sure, if the movie still had a nonsensical plot, but came in under budget, they would've at least broken even. Or if the movie's plot had been executed well and featured lots of fun, you know, Final Fantasy stuff, might have even made more money, or at least be looked back on more fondly, rather than being requested to appear on this show almost weekly. We leave today on this quote from Square's Jun Ida, who had this to say shortly before the movie opened. I hope that we will be producing Final Fantasy 23 with Columbia when I have much more gray hair. Hopefully there will be many more projects to come.
Thanks again to Trey Adams for requesting this episode. And if you'd like to request your own, head on over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to make your fantasy a reality or whatever that tagline was. See you next time and thanks for watching.